Welcome to the International Schools Podcast, where we discuss all aspects of technology and life in international schools, with new episodes live every two weeks. This podcast is sponsored by Apps Events. We're a Google for Education partner and active since the launch of Google Apps for Education in 2006. We're a team of former educators and all experts in helping schools integrate Google into their schools and their classrooms. All training is customized for each school and we make sure it has a lasting impact. Literally thousands of educators worldwide have earned their Google Educator certification with us with our certification boot camps and these take place every month and get your staff certified quickly. We also host Google Summits, which are fun, two-day conference-style events with concurrent sessions and keynotes delivered by experienced Google trainers, teaching on a broad range of topics using G Suite both in the classroom and in the school. Check it out over at appsevents.com, and we can bring any of these events to your school, which is an amazing way to build a Google community amongst your staff to support each other, plus to increase the profile of yourself and your school. The podcast is also brought to you by Acer for Education. People ask us what Chromebooks we recommend for schools, and after trying them all quite literally, we always recommend Acer. We've been to Acer headquarters in Taiwan to be part of product discussions, and they're genuinely the best thought out, most cost-effective, and most importantly durable devices out there. They're always innovating, including the first tablet running Chrome, and the first convertible touchscreen Chromebook. The latest version of this is a Spin 11, which has a stylus and two cameras, and we highly, highly recommend it for schools. They, of course, have a full range of Windows laptops, and for eSports fans, their Predator range is second to none. If you'd like more information, please just leave your email over at gg.gg forward slash Acer Education. That's gg.gg forward slash Acer Education, and we'll get right back to you. And now, on to the interview. Hello and welcome to the International Schools Podcast. Today I'm delighted to be talking to Kim Cofino. I, I, I hope I'm saying your name right. Cofino, is that right? Is that how you say it? Yeah. And who's based in Bangkok. And um, we were just saying, I met, I met Kim. Uh, I only vaguely remember it. I don't think Kim remembers it at all. But we met in an ECIS conference. Uh, well, you said 10 years ago. I thought it was less, but time, time flies, you know? It's got to be close to that because I was living in Japan and I've been in Bangkok for six years now. And... Maybe that was not my last year in Japan. Because that, that would have been uh, that, that would have been right when I started Apps Events. That was right. That would have been like probably the first thing I did when I started Apps Events was, was being at that event. So yeah, which is now yeah. Lines up. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So great to talk. So um, Kim runs Adura Learning, which is a, she's a consultant and just professional development for schools. Uh, she's involved in Learning Two, which some of you might know. It's a conference runs in Europe and Asia. Uh, and Cotel program she's involved in as well. So a lot of different things and used to work for a few schools. So I guess it's just good to talk a bit about your background, Kim. Like how did you, like how did you get started in education and where did you work first? Sure. When I was in university, a friend of mine did like an internship with Munich International School. Yeah. And we went to visit her in Munich. And I was like, oh, this is nice. I can live here. Yeah. I want to do this. So when she left that job, I actually applied for her job. I did not think I wanted to be a teacher. I wasn't interested in teaching, but I, for whatever reason, ended up getting that job, and I loved it. Like, from the first moment I got there, I loved it. Stayed there for five years. They ended up supporting me in getting my teaching license and my master's degree, and just basically totally professionally developing me into, when I left that school, I was the technology and learning coordinator for the middle school. Can, can, I, just, can I just jump into that? Cause... Just a really quick question about that. That's really interesting. So how, how did that work in terms of getting your teaching license? So did they partner with something like Teach Now or Teach Ready or one of these organizations? Because I'm curious if you're already there now. That's really interesting. There's, a pro- there's probably more than one. The one I did was called Fast Train, and it's based out of George Mason University in Fairfax, Virginia. Yeah. States. And there's lots of educators that have left Fast Train in the international school circuit. The program was developed to train spouses of people in foreign affairs. That's where the fast Right, right, right. Um, and so they had the classes at this time, it was during the summer and online during the year. So you could get certified in the state of Virginia through George Mason University through Fast Train as an international school. I mean, it's a U.S. state license, but as an international school teacher. Yeah, interesting. I don't know if you could do it without a U.S. social security number. I remember somebody having problems with that. Yeah. 
that's a great way to get trained if you don't have your teaching license when you're starting. Out. And there's like a there's like a summer program you said uh, part of it, and then and then some yeah. And do they assess? Do they do do they do some kind of assessment on your teaching when you're in the school, or is that is that done locally? So you have to have, like similar to anything you would do if you were living in the U.S., you have to do. I call it a practicum because I was in Germany at the time, but there's a word for it in the U.S. where it's like you're a te- student te- student te- yeah, student teacher, yeah, yeah. Teaching and have someone observe you and do all those, like, I guess you could call it assessments and record keeping and, you know, monitor your progress and uh, observation, yeah, sure. film your teaching and all that. It's like, it, it's exactly like what you would go through if you're in the U.S., but you can do it in an industry. That's really interesting, really, yeah. Cool, yeah, so, so, sorry. You know, you have to test in the program and test out of the program and do all the life. It's, like, very standard kind of in- interesting yeah that's, that's good to know. yeah cool so so yes yeah, so, so carry on I'm sorry to interrupt but that was interesting to me like so what happened after that you, you, you started in Munich and you enjoyed it yep stayed there for five years and after five years although I loved the school I never really felt um, that I loved Germany the location yeah. that much I wanted to be someplace warmer for one and maybe with more blue skies so my husband and I decided we wanted to go someplace different and we ended up taking a job at Mont Chiara International school in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Yeah, I've been there. Nice place. School. Yeah. yeah. But really enjoyed my time there. I was there at a really nice time for the school and stayed for, I think, two years. There was some transitions happening there with leadership and then ended up moving to International School Bangkok. Stayed there for three years. So that was like my five years in the tropics kind of thing, ready for a change. And then we went to Japan and worked at Yokohama International School for five years. And then we're now back in Bangkok, and my husband is working at NIST, and I work for myself uh, for a year of learning. Great, good stuff. So, um, what? Like, I'm curious about the transition from working in a school to to being a, a consultant. You know, I I, I do it obviously. Uh, well, what was your experience? How did it come about for you? I think the shortest version of the story is I was super engaged and passionate about professional learning. So I started doing professional learning for the teachers at the school I was at. And because that went well, I was suggested to go and teach at teachers' conferences. And so the more of those that you do, the more people get to know you, and then people start calling you in for weekend workshops or longer-term consulting. Sure. Basically, it got to a point where I was having so much of that work that I didn't feel like I could balance both things. Like I was basically working two full-time jobs for I would say a solid four years yeah. before I finally started to say, okay, I need to be like more part-time at school and see what happens in terms of the consulting. But since then, I think I've transitioned and now I feel like what you might generally refer to me as a consultant, what I really do is offer remote personalized professional learning for educators around the world and primarily focus on in-depth, long-term online learning through Coattail, the Certificate of Educational Technology and Information Literacy, the COACH, our academic year-long mentorship program for coaches, women who lead, our long-term professional learning for aspiring women leaders, and then uh, private mentoring packages that I do in a setting very similar to this. Wow, that's a lot of stuff. Do you, yeah, I think how you how you described it is, is I think that's the optimal way is um is you know if to test it out when you're still in a job to go off and do more training, do it off for free, and then to leave. I think it's it's a it's a high risk scenario just to say okay, I'm gonna cold turkey quit a school and then try to find customers because you know the sale like. A lot of educators don't know anything about sales, and and even though nobody wants to call it sales, and even though everybody wants to say if customers just come to me, I don't do anything. Like you have to sell, you know, and that selling is not it's not like old school, you know, smiling and dialing. It's networking, it's delivering, you know, getting references. But then you know you've got to encourage people to give you references. I I think how you did it is 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 the way. I don't know if you've got any thoughts on that. How to transition for someone who wanted to do that. I agree with you. I think it is a. It's like an easy transition in the sense that if you're super passionate about something, it seems natural to start sharing more. Yeah. But that piece that you described is the hard piece. Being a business owner, and you are even when you're just an individual. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Still a business owner. As educators, we're just not really trained for that kind of stuff. Yeah. Now I look at you know my budgeting and my accounting software, and like you're talking about the sales and marketing and the stuff that I do to make my company function. There is no way I could have turned from like being a technology coach, leading you know one-to-one programs 
in school to tomorrow being able to have the skills that I have today. And I still have so much to learn. So it's not like I'm not professing to be an expert by any stretch of the imagination, but it's a big growth opportunity. Exactly. Educators were really well versed in. Yeah, like you said, it's not just the sales, it's, it's the accounting, it's, um, you know, and also, you know, you, you've, you've, you've it's dealing with a lack of security, which I mean, I've been doing this 10 years now, you know, and when you haven't got a job and you don't know when you're getting paid, I mean, you know, it's, it, everyone's in a different situation. If your spouse is working, it's, it's, a, it's a good thing. Um, if you've got some savings, it's a good thing. There's different ways to mitigate it, but still, like we're conditioned like to have to want security as humans. And when you haven't got, when you don't know you can't, uh, any guarantee you're getting paid, it's, it's, it's hard. And I think people underestimate how tough that is. And when you have people working for you and you have to pay them, yeah. one thing, if maybe you're not making the income for yourself, but if you have people working for you and you're worried about being able to pay them, I mean, that's an even worse <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, I want, we have like nine full time people at Apps Events, you know, plus a lot of, we have a few contractors on kind of monthly retainers, and then mostly everybody else is usually teachers or, or consultants who we work with. Do you, so, how does it, so what does it do look like now? Is it just you, or do you have people working for you full time, or how do you structure it? It's, I'm the only full time person because I don't think my business is big enough yet to have other full time people. Yeah. Although in the recent months, I've been like, maybe I do need to take yeah. Um, so I have consultants doing various things with me. Like we have a director of Coattail, Ms. Layman, and she manages everything there is to do with Coattail. And yeah. so I'm already starting to think like the coaches are other like long-term professional learning for instructional coaches and school leaders and aspiring coaches. And that's another kind of big program, just like Coattail. So it makes sense to have a director of that program. Yeah. And then another program we have is called Mastermind Ed, and that's designed to be really focused professional learning around relevant um, issues in education today. So we're doing a lot of anti-racism, anti-bias training, and I'm thinking that is an opportunity to have someone kind of lead that program. But sure. we still have to kind of find the right time to build that stuff up. And then I have other people doing other things, but that's kind of the main thing is like looking at those different programs and seeing how one person can kind of manage that program fully so it takes that piece of it off my plate. Yeah, yeah. It's not scary. Yeah, and it, it's interesting because it, it's like what you're doing is, I think, a bit harder than what we do. I mean, we're focused on mostly on Google, although we're, we're an ISTE partner now, so we're doing the ISTE certified educator. But but ninety ninety five percent of what we do is is Google, and you're doing, you know, if you're doing women in leadership, you're doing the anti racism, you're doing teaching online. That's a lot of different like different topics, you know. Plus a few others you mentioned. Like, I mean, how do you how do you keep all the plate spinning and all these different things? Or is, is it is one ticket most of the time? Or how, how does it split between all these things? It is a very good question. And it's something that I, as a coach, I believe really passionately in the power of coaching. So I have a coach for my sport, which is powerlifting. And I have a coach for my business. And that's what I'm working on in my business coaching is like, what can we slim down? Do we really need to have all of these things available? Can I focus in a little bit more? Because I think I'm the type of person, like my blog is called Always Learning, and I just, I love learning. It's one of our kind of mission statements is that we're in relentless pursuit of better professional learning. We are relentless learners. That's me. I'm a relentless learner. And so when there's something that kind of captivates me, and I think is something that's really engaging and relevant for educators today, I kind of can't help myself working yeah. that thing. But I know that's like a major issue with entrepreneurs, right? Don't do everything. Sure. In niche down. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, it's true. It's um, but you know, then again, as you know, every it depends on your personality type. I mean, there are people who 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 do a lot of different things and and do it well, and, they, and there's other people who can just focus on one thing. Some people get bored if they just do one thing, you know. Like it's like uh, it depends on your personality type a lot. I think. Um, I'm not to be the person who gets bored, but I know that is why I got in the situation that I'm in, and now I'm trying to like change my mentality about it a little bit and really recognize the depth that can be kind of uncovered and shared about one specific topic um, to yeah, just dig deeper in those areas as opposed to getting more variety. Yeah. I couldn't even begin to tell you what I might change. 
I mean, I, I, I do get bored, but I mean, I, I've done so many things. Like I've, I've started two, two software companies, is, very, is a bit of a big word, small cost software products. And, and I'm never ever doing that again. It's so much stress running this. And then having, you know, we, we, we in the early days, pre-Google Classroom, we had a, a learning management system we made. And then we made a ticketing system, which we sold uh, not for much money to someone who, someone who took it over. But like, I, I'm just, I, I'm always looking at shiny objects. Like, and I'm just, I've stopped myself doing it now because it's, it's, it's so it's so hard so for me, but for my personality type, I can't do it. You know. Now, how so? So you started this, and, and how is it? So obviously, said it's just you. Like, what's your? So do you want to tell us a bit about Cotel? Because some people will probably know it, some people don't know it. What's your? What's that? And what's your involvement in that? Sure. So Cotel is the Certificate of Educational Technology and Information Literacy. It's a year and a half, five course, what we call micro-credential program. So you get a certificate at the end, and if you would like, you can earn university credits for, that's primarily for Americans who need that to yeah. maintain their teacher licensure. And basically that program is designed to empower usually classroom teachers to make their technology use of the classroom like more engaging and authentic and inspiring for the kids, yep. get them ready for technology-rich learning. What usually happens through the CoTail program is people get so engaged in their professional growth with technology that they want to continue learning, and that's why we built out some other, like that's kind of how so the other stuff started. Yeah. But people finish CoTail and they're like, I want us to learn with you, what can I do? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and was that um, was that Jeff Jeff Utek just started that? Or was, or you, was it you and him, or what was that? So the program actually began at International School Bangkok when I was there the year before Jeff came. Uh huh. I don't know if any of the schools that you have worked at or worked with, but we had the SUNY um, leadership program through the State University of New York. Yeah. We were looking for another program <coughs> for educators for technology. Got it. We built out the curriculum, and then the year Jeff came, he taught it with me and Dennis Harder. Um, well, I think it's just the three of us that taught it at first. Yeah. And then it got really successful. Cool. Face setting and started building out um, like broader. And then me and Jeff owned that program for, I'm going to say like five, five to eight years, maybe. Wow. And, and ran that program together. And then Jeff has transitioned to do other things the way it happens in the business world. Yeah. yeah. So now it's mine. Okay, cool. Yeah, it's interesting how how that's gone. A lot of people do it. It's it's very popular with international schools, and it seems like seems like an interesting course to do for sure. Yeah. What about um, yeah. What what about learning too? That's an interesting. It's ne- I've I've almost gone twice. It's never it's never worked out. I've never been able to figure out how to how to make it happen. But that's an interesting conference. It's 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 capped quite a small number of people, isn't it? Each year, is it 150 or something like that? It depends on the year. And when I was so now I'm on the board of learning too. I started out being a conference attendee, obviously, and then was asked to be a presenter and then was asked to organize the actual events. So I think I organized like three or four where I was like the committee chair or whatever our titles were. And then now I'm on the board. So I don't have a real day-to-day look at what's going on at 32 because we meet, you know, quarterly. It's not like a management yeah, yeah. in-depth kind of situation. But usually we try to cap at 400. And then depending on the situation, it might be smaller than that, you know, based on visa issues or timing or whatever it may be. But the intention is for it to be small and not, and personal, and not just be a massive, you know, bench. Oh, 400 is already pretty big, you know, like that's already like, that's that's a decent sized conference, you know. It's definitely a conference. It's not a workshop, it's a conference. Yeah. It's also not that conference where it's like halls of exhibitors. And my first ed tech conference was that, that educational technology conference. Yeah, I'm good at every year. It's just been canceled, actually. Yeah, and that was like my understanding of what ed tech conferences were. So it's Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Bet, Bet's like a trade show, isn't it? I mean, ISTE, ISTE is a, co- a convex, it's a conference and a trade show. Um, Bet's, to, you know, like. I, I'm, I'm actually quite disappointed. Um, Bet's, I just it got cancelled last week. You know, I, I knew it was going to happen, but because normally that happens second week of January, and that's the start of my year. You know, we go to the mountains for Christmas and year, and then I always fly to London third week of January, and that's like that's the start of my year. You know, Bet, I mean, you get to meet everybody there. You know, I mean, we work with Acer, we work with Google, obviously Google. Everyone from Google's there. We have people on the Google stand. Everyone's there, and like I, I love it as a place to meet people. You know, that's it's it's a great event. But like you say, it's it, it's kind of um, it's overwhelming. Like it's. Yeah, it's, it's 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 a lot, you know. I mean, we're we're actually running a conference in Bangkok next year called the Connected School, and because we've been running Google summits for years, and we wanted to kind of expand it a little bit, so we we're doing it's going to be a Google summit, but also an Apple and a Microsoft summit, 
and then a lot of stuff on digital citizenship. We should get you to present, actually. It'd be great. We should talk about getting, getting you out because it's right in your hometown. But it's going to be in October, so we'll see if hopefully people can travel by then. Fingers crossed. Um, but I, I want to I keep that at like, you know, I want to keep that at like 200, 250. That's kind of my goal, you know. I want to, um, it, it's always tempting to want to sell my tickets and make it bigger and bigger. But, you know, the, you know, the level, the, there's a, a, once you get above like what you're talking about, four or 500, it gets really hard to meet a lot of people, you know. It becomes a bit overwhelming and some people kind of sit in the corner and don't want to talk to anyone because there's just too much going on. Um, interesting. So, uh, but learning too, like, so, I mean, how would you describe the conference? Because a lot of people, have, maybe people don't know about it. <laughs> Gosh, I should have prepared our tagline. Ah, it's okay. It's very casual. Basically, the, the purpose of the conference is to look at innovative learning, not just technology. So it's not like a tools conference or a tech conference. It's about building community of educators who are interested in innovative learning. And what I personally think I especially like about it, I think is kind of unique, is that we have what we call learning to leaders, and those people run longer sessions, like their threads through the conference. So you would join a topic and be with a leader for the morning, both days, and a big chunk of time on the first evening, so that you really get to dive a bit deeper into a specific topic over yeah. the course of the conference, as opposed to you're just going to one hour session, one hour session, one hour session, one hour session. There's like cohorts. And so we have that piece, which is like the learning to leaders, and then there's like a Java like thread that goes through that you meet with that cohort every day at the conference. So it's a really community driven, connected environment where you are spend quality time with the people you're learning with and it's not just passive learning that you see. Got it. Yeah, yeah, that sounds really good. Like I say, I definitely want to get along to it. It's just uh, so many, so many events to go to. You know, I mean, I, I try to go to Air Course and ISTE quite often, and then plus, you know, I, I've I've exhibited at some events with apps events. You know, we've had a stand and stuff, and sometimes I just go to speak. And there's a lot of reasons. You know, I, I I'm I'm someone that really likes conferences. I don't know about you. Like I, I love going to conferences. I love meeting people. It's it's more the networking than the than the sessions for me usually. But. Um, It, it depends on the conference. There's a big, you know, there's, there's some great, it's all, you know, with the sessions, that you, it just depends on what are the speakers, you know. Have you got people that are there just to really share concrete knowledge or have you got people there, you know, when you have people that want to sort of sell something in a session and it's just not interesting to anyone, you know. <laughs> Which happens a bit, you know, some, in some of these conferences, you know, especially in America. Um, cool, so... What about, um, that you mentioned online, like is, is, I mean, right now, obviously everything's online, but pre-COVID, were you only training online or were you doing it in person or how do you structure that kind of stuff? I'll still do in-person stuff if that's what people want, but primarily I really want my business to be available to anyone and I really feel like the only way to do that and make it financially viable is to do it in a virtual setting and I feel I don't want to say lucky because that's absolutely the wrong word, but I think now people really understand the potential of learning in remote settings, and that is really exciting to me because I think maybe for a long time people were not sure that you could build close connections or build a relationship or be part of a community or feel connected or feel like you could access deep learning in a virtual setting because we've all gone through university-level online courses, and they're awful. Yeah, yeah, terrible, yeah like that they're personalized they're customized they're unique and that is the environment that i think people are able to take the most from because you're doing it in your school setting with your school colleagues without having that travel lag without having that i'm going somewhere and when i come back i'm not going to do anything about it it's happening every day in your school context and to me that's what sustainable growth means so i'm really passionate about doing things online i think that's for me, that's like the future of professional learning. Yeah, I don't know if I agree or not. I'm, I, I, I don't know what my opinion is. It changes every day, you know? Because, I mean, I like, I mean, I've been online since the beginning. We've always done online training since day one, but we've also do a lot of in-person training, you know? Um, and I kind of, I, I'm not sure. I mean, you're right. You can design it to be much more engaging online, definitely. And, and I, like you, I've done online masters and it was horrendous, you know? The only, uh, and I, I, did a, I did a course recently at the University of Nottingham and the only good interaction, we had our own WhatsApp group and we, and we had our own group video chats every now and again. And that was the only good part. Everything in the university was just horrendous, you know? Like the Moodle was horrendous. Like Canvas is an awful system. All these systems are awful. And like, and then, and then there's no engaging teaching. They record a lecture and then expect, and then, you know, 
the, the chat functionality doesn't work. It's it's awful, you know. So you can definitely make it engaging, and we obviously you know like to think we do. I'm, I'm sure you do from what I've seen of what you do. I'm just not sure it's a substitute for in person. You know, I know it scales better, and I know you can reach a lot more people. That's the positive side. I just don't know if people are. I mean, we need we need connections as a human, you know, as humans. That's that's what I that's what I think. So I, I don't know what what the, I I tend to think the future is going to be more blended, and you know, it'll be a lot more online stuff. I think the face to face is going to happen, but maybe it'll be like like for example the ISTE course we were in ISTE Educator. There's a two day face to face, and then it's online. You know, maybe it'll be a bit of a blended solution. I, I'm not sure. I mean, what, what do you see as a future, the post COVID future for PD? Oh big question. Big question. <laughs> For me, I think I would like to see more schools taking the power of teams and applying that into a remote learning setting. Yep. Because I think that when teachers learn together, learning becomes sustainable and embedded and owned by all of those educators. So one of the things we try really hard to do, particularly in our mastermind ed courses, is encourage school leaders to register a team of teachers. So like right now we have, I think, 12 teachers from the American School in Johannesburg, AISJ, in our social justice course with Dr. Sauce Jaber. And knowing that there's 12 teachers from one school in one course learning about social justice means that those 12 teachers are gonna be super engaged in making a difference in their school context as opposed to when you have just one person. Good point, yeah, yeah, yeah. Where and they come back and then they gotta sell it to everybody, right? So for me, I think the vision is teams, sustainable professional learning, and also long-term professional growth because that's another issue I have with face-to-face events is, and I've run plenty of them, like I'm not criticizing them, but it's one day or it's two days and then you don't have this long-term connection to the people you're learning with or growth over time yep. or ability to demonstrate understanding over a period of time. We've done quite a few coattail cohorts where there's a face-to-face at the beginning and a face-to-face at the end, and I like that a lot, and maybe that's something that can come back post-COVID. Um, yeah. But I do feel really strongly that you can build meaningful connections in virtual spaces. I don't think it has to exclusively happen face-to-face, although I value and enjoy face-to-face time as well. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Like, if I take the two university programs I've done, like, postgraduate, like, one was... Uh, a cohort together in the beginning for a few days and then online and the second one was just online and it was night and day the connection we all had where we did the in-person face-to-face now maybe maybe this university could have could have organized it in a better way so so the online one was together but like i just haven't got really good connections from that but but you know again like it doesn't mean it can't be done i think you've, if you've got if you're someone like you who's got a lot of experience in making it happen, I think you probably can. Is it the same? I don't know. That's a question I can't answer, you know? I, mean, I can think you could probably get it close. About the value of being together in the room, and I think there is a huge value of being together in a room, but it's only the people who are able to... To get to the room, exactly. Yeah, 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 exactly. That's a good thing. Uh, so in the last <coughs> meeting of the coach, we had um, Panama... I'm going to try to list all the places. Panama, Oregon, New York. This is this isn't everybody. This is just the people who are able to make that meeting. So Panama, Oregon, New York, Russia, Saudi Arabia, Japan, Kuwait, me, and Bangkok. I feel like I'm missing a few people, but like all in a room together, all talking. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I'm learning about coaching. You know, when, when, when do you have that conference, you know? Sure. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's the positive side. It's true. And, you know, like, and again, it sounds like I'm knocking online, but I mean, we've been a virtual organization for 10 years. Like, you know, we've got a bunch of full-time staff. We only, this is, this is how we communicate. The only way we communicate, you know, I mean, some people, I don't even, I might go two years without even seeing them, you know, so it can be done. Definitely. I just, yeah, I don't know. Maybe it's just because right now I just really miss like going somewhere meeting people, you know, like. I mean, we're in, we're in heavy lockdown here, you know, there's, there's even a curfew 9 p.m. to 5 a.m. You can't even go outside. Um, it's it's strict. Everything's closed apart for shops and uh, food, food and like pharmacies and stuff. So it's like proper lockdown situation here. So I think that's why like probably missing you know a bit of a face to face interaction. Yeah, Bangkok's pretty good, isn't it? I talk to my friends there, and everything's open. I mean, not everything, but it's you can have you can live a semi normal life right now. 100%. Yeah. But but once once the borders but that's the question is once the borders open and things you know then things are going to change you know right now no one's coming in you know well they're coming in and doing quarantine. 
like very lightly for tourism, like actual tourism, not business travelers, but actual tourism, and they're starting to relax the restrictions. I just read something maybe a couple of days ago about changing the quarantine from 14 to 10 days. Yep. So that will be really interesting to see the impact on like community. I, get, I don't know if it counts as community spread if people are coming in, not quarantined long enough and then spread yep. to see the impact on, because right now, all of our active cases are always people coming from outside the country. It's not local spread. Sure. So it'll be really interesting to see what happens when yeah. restrictions are loosened a bit. That's interesting, I, I didn't know that. Look, um, that's pretty much, I think we're pretty much up to like half an hour. It's, it's been a super interesting chat. Like, um, I guess, what, what, what do you want to promote? Like, what, what, where should people go to find you online? What, what people listen to this? Like, what kind of things could they benefit from that, what you're doing? Oh, fabulous. I would love to talk about it. Yeah. Learn from me. Um, so we have the four key programs. Our programs are Coattail, the Institute of Educational Technology and Information Literacy. Uh, the Coach, which is a micro-credential program just like Coattail, designed for building your instructional coaching skills, having better conversations, being a leader. Women Who Lead, which is for aspiring leaders. And we have Mastermind Ed, which is for relevant and authentic experiences about specific topics that are relevant to education right now. We also have Private Mentoring, which is individual mentoring with me. And you can find all of that at edurolearning.com, E-D-U-R-O learning.com. And you can find us on all the social media platforms, particularly Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, at Eduro Learning. Or you can find me, at Ms. Cabino, on Twitter, or at Super Kimbo on Instagram. Great. Well, I'll put some links uh, in the show notes. Kim, uh, thank you very much. It's been, uh, been a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you.